When I was four years old, my best friend Chris lived in a three-story walk-up in Boston, Massachusetts. Nancy, her mother, would hoist me onto her back to get me in the house. She would throw out her arms and say, this is your captain speaking, please fasten your seatbelts. I would laugh and she would make airplane noises, sometimes for my amusement. But then she would also sometimes run up the stairs just to be able to get me in the house. The stairs in their walk-up were slim, steep, and incredibly creaky, painted over in these baby blue and lilac hues. I loved that house. I just didn't love the fact that you had to climb three flights of stairs in order to get to the bathroom. That house became harder to love as I got older, as I got taller, as I got heavier. Since adolescence, I've been making decisions that other children, other people, don't have to consider on a regular basis. Whether or not at school we had to do a project at the library or stay in the cafeteria instead of go to someone's house. If sleepovers were even possible. And to the credit of my friends, my parents' friends, and my parents, we made it work for a while. But eventually, we realized that most houses were built for square people, and I was a round peg. Chris and I drifted apart, due partially to the fact that her space was not accessible. The disability tax is this idea in the disability community recognized as the premium or additional cost that people with disabilities have to pay in order to gain access. To give you an example, I lived in Maine in high school. Um, when I went to college, I was in North Carolina, moved back here for a little you know, recoup time after graduation, and then moved to DC. Because I was here and not in DC, my dad had to go look at apartments because there was no information online as to whether the apartments were accessible or not. He looked at over 15 different apartments. Only one would work for a power scooter and then eventually a power chair. I am lucky enough to live there now, but it's not ideal, either physically or financially. Unfortunately, the disability tax is not only financial, it's also emotional. This year, most of my family is headed to Philadelphia for Thanksgiving at my extended family's house. Because their house is not accessible and they chose not to hold it in a different location, I will be spending Thanksgiving alone in DC. But this is not just my loss. This is not just my sorrow. I am rolling up to my apartment in DC about a year ago, and I ran into another childhood friend, Kitty. Kitty and I went to elementary school together. Our moms were in the same book club. We had French tutoring and birthday parties together. We hung out a lot. Uh, but Kitty's house also wasn't accessible. And when we switched schools, it became harder to hang out. Kitty and I hadn't connected in over 15 years, except for the occasional happy birthday or congrats on graduation on Facebook. But as we were sitting outside on my patio, it was like no time had passed and our friendship blossomed again. 
I asked her how her parents were doing, how she was liking DC, how hard was law school really? And she said, Kings, there's something I have to tell you. I had started using a power chair since I had last seen Kitty, and all of my mobility issues had been magnified. Kitty lived in a beautiful historic neighborhood in downtown DC called DuPont Circle. And while her building had an elevator, there were five steps down to get into the lobby, which means I could not visit her space. She looked at me and said, Kings, I'm so sorry you can't come over. She recognized that not only was this a barrier for me, it was a barrier for us. It was preventing a real connection and a real opportunity. This happens more often than you think. And inaccessible housing makes me so mad, I almost start crying sometimes. Um, but it's not really sadness, it's rage. It's hot and bitter and biting. Because every time I look at something that isn't accessible, I see exclusion. I ask myself the question, why was I not good enough to be considered in this equation? Where was the empathy and understanding in being accessible? One in four Americans has an identified disability of some kind, and yet only 1%, not even, of all US housing is considered accessible. I say considered because there are those of us that know that access is a spectrum. And we know that the legal standards have been set on the lower end of the scale. The US Census did a report in 2019 that stated that by 2030, 60, 55% of Mainers would be over the age of 65 by 2030. By 2050, the US population over 65 would double and the US population over 85 would triple. That means an increased need for mobility devices, chairs, scooters, assistive care, personal care assistance, nursing, but also accessible housing. If we cannot support the community in which we live every day to be able to connect to be able to socialize, to be able to be accessible. We are not planning for our future, and we are not planning for success. Maine especially needs to focus on this. Many of our residents are teachers, construction workers, fishermen, sailors, all of whom do back-breaking work well into their seventh decade. What will happen to those Mainers when they cannot climb their own stairs? If you say nursing homes, I've got unfortunate news for you. Nursing homes are often incredibly expensive, not terribly accessible, and we do not have, as a country, enough space and accessible community and nursing homes to be able to support the aging population. We need to start focusing now on noticing the spectrum of access so that by 2030, when we start hitting those margins, we can support our community. I would love to build a house from the ground up so that instead of a cage or an obstacle course, my home could feel like a home. I want that for everyone. And I want everyone to notice the spectrum of access because eventually 
it will affect you. And if we are not planning for success, if we are not planning for access, we are disabling our potential and we are disabling our future selves. Thank you.